So hello everyone, uh, welcome to the Centre for Research in Autism and Education's April webinar. Um, it's really lovely to see so many of you here today. And today's session is particularly um, a special one for me because I'm delighted to welcome my predecessor, Professor Liz Pelicano, a previous director of Cray, who will be speaking to us today. For most of you, I'm sure Liz needs no introduction, but I'm going to give her one anyway. Liz is one of the leading autism researchers in the world today. She's Professor and Research Fellow at the Macquarie School of Education in Australia, where she conducts outstanding research into the experiences and challenges faced by autistic people and how they impact on day-to-day -day life, education and employment. She ensures that her research influences policy and practice and is conducted with a participatory ethos, working with autistic people, not on autistic people. This is in fact an ethos that she implemented when at Cray, and it's something that we've been proud to continue ever since. Today, Liz is gonna be talking to us about the everyday experiences of autistic people and families during the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic. If you'd like to ask Liz a question, you can either submit them anonymously via slido.com using the event code hashtag W826, and all that information is in the chat, or you can type them into the chat directly and we'll ask Liz as many as we can at the end. So now I'm delighted to hand over to Professor Liz Pelicano. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for that very lovely introduction. Um, I'm assuming everyone can see my slides, so um, someone will tell me if you can't. Um, but thank you so much for inviting me to be part of your webinar series. Um, it's really wonderful to be back at Cray, although I'm not really back because our Prime Minister won't let us travel anywhere. Um, but it's good to be back, at least virtually. I've really loved watching Cray from afar since I've moved on. Um, all the incredible work, that sense of community, I miss that so much. Um, and especially the amazing energy that I've seen um, Anna and Laura, you know, have brought to their roles makes me rather nostalgic. Um, but tonight I'm zooming from Sydney where it's already nighttime um, here. Our winter's nights are drawing in as your spring nights are drawing out. Um, while I'm here, I wanna acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Gamaragal people. And it's here it's customary to pay deep respects to elders past, present and future. And I also want to recognize that sovereignty over this land was never ceded. So as you know all too well, this past year has been a year like no other. In Australia, in early 2020, it began with catastrophic bushfires, which were followed by floods in some parts. And it was at the end of the summer, so your winter, that the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Most Australians were required to stay home unless engaging in essential activities, so schools moved online, restaurants, bars, theatres and museums closed. People were told to work from home. Socialising with friends and family was halted. Now these restrictions, which have since eased here in Australia, but are obviously ongoing in many places, have been met very hard on many people. And evidence from around the world indicates that people have suffered extraordinary stresses, stresses and pressures and that there's been a detrimental effect on people's mental health. Initial research last year had suggested that the cost to well-being had been particularly high for those who were already vulnerable in some way. For example, through, through living with pre-existing mental health conditions or through working at the lower paid end of the labor market. My focus, um, or my team's focus, has been on a, on, you know, obviously on a group that is often considered vulnerable for the very reasons that I described, the autistic children, young people and adults. And in the webinar today, I'm going to describe a qualitative study that we did during the initial lockdown period um, to understand the everyday experiences of autistic people and families during that initial lockdown. And I'll, as, I, as I go through my talk, I'll talk about the aims of the study what we did, what we found, and what it all means. So there is good reason to suspect that autistic people would have found this period particularly difficult. Existing research suggests that many autistic people faced you know, severe challenges to their well-being well before the pandemic hit. 
Most autistic people have additional co-occurring conditions, including especially anxiety and depression. And they also frequently require additional services and supports within the education and health and care sectors. Services and supports with which the pandemic placed under threat. Autistic people are also often thought to be uncomfortable with swift and unexpected change and to struggle with future uncertainty. But some autistic people, as well as those who work with and support the autistic community, have spoken more positively about the COVID-19 lockdowns. These more optimistic voices contended that you know, several of the service delivery adaptations of this period, such as moving schools, work and therapies swiftly online, as occurred very early in the crisis, have actually served autistic people well. Some also argue that autistic people may be more adept at dealing with social distancing than non-autistic people, as they can often find you know, conventional social interactions unsettling. Indeed, these conventional autism theories or autism science have expected that autistic people, perhaps more than anyone, have, will have coped best with the lockdown that have been most governments' response to the COVID-19 pandemic. After all, the very word autism comes from Greek autos, or self, isolated self. And as one autistic adult described sarcastic, sarcastically to me in an interview, according to the theories, we self-isolate. We do that all our lives. So autistic people are ready for lockdown. So our study last year set out to discover whether the experiences of autistic people and their families are consistent with these claims. In short, our research team wanted to, you know, gain a really a fuller sense of what this moment was really like early in the pandemic for autistic people and their families. We wanted to understand how different people respond in uncertain times, and in particular, what support autistic people and their families might need. So these were our four research questions. We asked specifically, how did autistic people Children, young people and adults and their families experienced the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic. What did they make of the new online service provisions in health and education? What opportunities, if any, did social distancing rules provide? And what lessons, if any, do we all need to learn from the experience so that we're better prepared in future? So critically for this study, we adopted a participatory approach, that is the working together of autistic and non-autistic researchers, which had a huge influence on our research. In terms of the size and depth of the sample, so the community reach, I can tell you that if I had done this study without the connections of our autistic um, partners, it would have taken me months to recruit the number of people that we ended up speaking to for this sort of interview-based study. The participatory approach also influenced the kinds of questions and the way in which they were asked. Our partners ensured that our interviews were respectful, thorough and supportive of our autistic participants. And having autistic people involved in the analysis has also been a massive benefit, drawing attention to things that would have otherwise been missed. So the research team is comprised of me, Melanie Hayworth from the autistic-led organisation in Australia, um, Reframing Autism, Jack Den Houting, who's a postdoctoral fellow in my team here um, at Macquarie, Robin Stewart, who I'm sure you all know, um, from the UK's Wellcome Trust and UCL, or Cray, Anna Urbanowitz from RMIT University in Melbourne, and Simon Brett, who's a PhD candidate of mine, Ileana Maggiati from the University of Western Australia and Mark Steers, who runs the Sydney Policy Lab at the University of Sydney. So Mel, Jack and Robin are autistic researchers and me, Simon, Anna, Ileana and Mark are not autistic. We also critically ad adopted a qualitative approach to elicit people's experiences. And we did that um, because we, I, as a team, I guess we didn't feel that a survey based approach was really going to get the kind of the rich, the richness of people's experiences that we, that, that qualitative methods, um, could do. Um, so we, we adopted both a participatory approach and a qualitative approach. 
So on the 6th of May 2020, um, so kind of well into the, um, the first lockdown period, we posted on social media inviting autistic adults, parents of autistic children and young autistic people to take part in a 45 to 60 minute in-depth interview about their everyday experiences of life during the COVID-19 pandemic thus far. And we had an overwhelming response. So I had received in my inbox 150 emails within 48 hours. Um, and I think that's a real testament to our participatory approach and the connections um, um, with, our, um, with the autistic community. So we ended up speaking to 142 people, um, including 43 autistic people, 83 parents um, of autistic children. 35 of those parents were autistic themselves. So autistic parents of autistic children. And we also spoke to 16 um, young autistic people, 12 to 18 year olds. Um, so it was, a, it, was a, it was a lot of interviews, actually. Um, people spoke to us on average for about 55 minutes. So they were pretty long interviews, some much longer. During the interviews, people told us about their day to day experiences during the pandemic and the lockdowns and the impact that they felt that it had on their lives, on their living, working, and learning arrangements their social relationships, their access to services and their well-being. And of course, to make our methods as accessible as possible, obviously we couldn't see people face to face, um, but people could choose to do the interview in a format that was most comfortable for them. So either through Zoom, over the phone, through email or through real-time text-based chat. So we obviously have a wealth of data here. We have almost 7,000 minutes of interviews with people. Um, throughout over those different formats. Um, and so it's taken, take, we, took, we did those interviews over a six week period. Um, uh, so I did about, I did more than half of those interviews and each of the team did um, um, the rest of them. So it's taken a long time to analyze them. <laughs> I will never do a qualitative study this big ever again. Um, but our participants came from a wide range of backgrounds and faced a number of very different challenges. The people with whom we spoke came from many different parts of Australia. So 69% were from cities and 31% were from inner and outer regional communities. 4% identified as Aboriginal. 60% of our autistic adults were in paid employment prior to the pandemic. And 20% of those saw some change to their employment during COVID-19. People also reported that they or their children had often multiple neurodevelopmental and or mental health conditions. So more than half um, of our participants mentioned that they lived with anxiety and or depression. Some people also reported complex and chronic um, physical illness. Although again, others also described being in good health. Most autistic children, as well as a smaller number of autistic adults were in receipt of a plan um, through the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which is a scheme in Australia that gives um, people access, disabled people for access to funding for supports and services, including during the lockdown period. So those were our participants. So what did we find? Well, as you might imagine, there was a huge variation in people's responses, even within families. But I'll, um, but I'll start with talking through the positives. And I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, when I'm talking through the results, because this is all qualitative, I'm gonna be referring a lot um, to participants' direct quotes. Um, sometimes I'll just, I'll just talk them through and other times I'll just read them. So here's the positives. So as many of you well know, in the wake of the pandemic, we witnessed unprecedented changes in the ways that we work, learn and access services. So entire workforces began working from home, schools and university students switched to virtual classrooms, and people were able to access GP services, mental health treatments and other services via telehealth in order to promote social distancing and limit the spread of the virus. Many of our participants reminded us that the disability community have long been campaigning for more accessible arrangements for the way that they work, learn and access services often to be told that such arrangements were simply impossible. To some, the scale and speed with which these innovations were implemented during COVID-19 demonstrated that the whole world 
can work remotely. Our participants wanted people to be more open to kids doing part-time schooling and part-time at home schooling, and for remote working to continue post COVID-19, creating opportunities for a lot of autistic and other people that have disabilities who would thrive and be so much more productive in a home environment. As one autistic parent put it, the world has shown that all the things we needed weren't actually that hard to give. Things became a bit more inclusive and this proves the world, the world can be. I want to see this continue. People also reported feeling a bit more financially secure too. 20% of the adults to whom we spoke reported receiving their main income through government income supports and benefits. Many, though not all of these people, had seen an increase to their welfare payments as a result of the Australian government's response to the coronavirus crisis, including what was known as the coronavirus supplement. For these participants, such changes had simply taken away the money stress, often significantly improving their, their lives. One autistic adult described how it's the first time in ages I haven't felt stressed and fearful all the time about losing my income and or being forced to do things that make me ill. Participants also described how the lockdown period gave them space and time to learn, live and rethink their lives. So participants reported feeling less beholden to the often very regulated and intense schedules of their pre-COVID lives, schedules that autistic people often find difficult. As a result, they felt less stressed, more relaxed and more in control of their day-to-day -day lives. These sentiments were conveyed most clearly by our young autistic participants. Many described how they simply had more time and freedom in their days. Although people felt unsettled by the rapid changes to daily routines when lockdown began, they also found reassurance that they had, they had found space and time to pursue their interests and hobbies, at least the ones that were doable during lockdown. And these included a huge range of things, cooking, gardening, writing, drawing, sewing, cosplay, building Lego, choir singing, animals, playing Minecraft, Dungeons and Dragons and other online games. Now changes in schooling itself were vital here too. So in pre-COVID times, young autistic people frequently report struggling with the rigid and fast paced timetables of mainstream schooling. And during the initial COVID-19 lockdowns, in contrast, some young people described how their high schools had readjusted their timetables so that they could, so that they could get an extra five minutes between classes to walk around and to talk to my family, which is good. One young person said, it's much better than actual school. I actually get stuff done. It was more flexible. I could get tasks set for the entire week and I'd be able to do them at my own time at my own pace as long as they were done by the Friday. I just found that a lot easier than the structured time of 70 minutes for each lesson. Another emphasized that learning from home just fits my needs better. It's more of a relaxed environment and I don't have to be in a loud place with loud people all the time. The resources are more available. It's easier to get into the lessons. I can, lit I can wear literally whatever I want without being judged. And parents often agreed. They described how prior to COVID-19, everything was go, go, go. They were, they were knackered from calendars that were always full with school activities and after school and weekend appointments for their children's therapies. As a result, many reported a state of bliss during lockdown. They felt less stressed and less pressured and less scheduled. Given that participants reported having this greater space for being, it was also not surprising that many reported enjoying newfound space and time with family, including pets. Parents told us that they loved being able to spend more time at home with children and partners, and children and, and many young people spoke enthusiastically about the chance to pursue their interests and passions. One autistic adult spoke of the advantage of partners working from home. She said, we've just had lunch and it's lovely where he gets to cook and I get to enjoy his cooking and we just hang out together. Others spoke of the opportunity to speak to my family more than normal, including their grandparents, and concluded that we're a stronger family unit as a result of the experience. 
Participants also reported the connections they felt to their online and local communities. Some described how people have become a lot more friendly and open, that they were smiling and greeting each other more as they passed each other on the streets, and that they had started to get to know the people down across the road. They also reported witnessing lots of acts of kindness in the neighbourhood. They felt that they had found community again. Summing it up, one autistic adult said that they have a good community here, but COVID-19 has made it even stronger. And young autistic people themselves also reported how there's a good side of staying at home, which included being able to be around your family a lot more and being able to play with my brother more. It's kind of nice having them at home. Participants also described the positive effects that their pets had on their mental health. So this is the words of one um, 13 year old who said, there are some moments where if life gets so stressful, I'll just go and sit on the empty, cha on the empty, chair, the empty room on the chair next to my cat and just fall asleep with her on the other chair. I think that's a lot better. Even though she probably doesn't understand how I'm feeling as far as I'm aware. It's very therapeutic just to sit with her and think. Not all of the experiences of the initial COVID-19 lockdown period were positive, however. So some autistic people and parents of autistic children reported feeling that there was very little that there was positive about it. And even those who were more positive shared a strong sense of profound challenge. In fact, the overwhelming sense from the discussions we, have ha we had with people have been of, of you know, quite severe difficulties that autistic people and their families faced. As one participant very bluntly put it, no, this isn't a holiday for me. It's been really stressful. So on to the challenges. Now, the first of these challenges was that a number of our participants felt deeply unsettled by what the pandemic meant for society, the economy and the future. Very much in common with what you know, many non-autistic people have felt during the early period of the COVID-19 pandemic. One spoke of feeling um, as if we are living through a prolonged disaster event. She said, while an earthquake goes away soon enough, this keeps going on. People were worried about racism within their communities, targeted at themselves or their children. And they were also concerned for others in their communities who might have fallen through the gaps this time. As one autistic parent highlighted, I hold grave concerns for already vulnerable members of our community those with disabilities, mental health concerns, recent migrants, those living in poverty, those impacted by violence, addiction, etc., who were already not receiving anything even close to sufficient support and would be the first to suffer even more as a result of the economic fallout of restrictions. The second of the challenges was the unexpected and immediate disruptions to people's day-to-day -day lives that the COVID-19 pandemic called, caused. And while these disruptions have been challenging for everyone, they are particularly distressing for many autistic people who often struggle to deal with uncertainty. As one autistic adult described, it's been really crappy. I like being by myself. It's just like I, I like also being able to choose when I'm with other people and have some sense of control over my life. And it feels like I don't have control over my schedule. It's up to the government. It's up to everything externally. And it's just one of those things where I guess because there's nothing I can do to instill a sense of control over my schedule and over my life. It just feels like everything's chaotic. Autistic adults reported how stressful it had been to see their everyday routines completely messed up. People reported that their sleeping had been disrupted and they haven't been eating much or that they were eating too much. Parents talked of the sharp spike in their children's anxiety as they experienced the loss of the the usual routine of going to school, not being able to go to the park and to do their usual things, sometimes on top of anxiety about getting the virus itself. And these issues appear to have been exacerbated for those who already had a pre-existing mental health condition, which reflected you know, many of our, um, the people with whom we spoke. They simply didn't have their usual coping strategies to fall back on. They weren't able to take their children to spend time with their grandparents to make it a little easier on me. 
They were unable to go out and have coffee and be able to have friends come over. They found it difficult to get rid of their children's extra energy outside. They also weren't able to enact their regular forms of self-soothing. One young person said, being able to remove myself and come back and feel a bit calmer when I come back. Instead, I wasn't able to get out of the space. It was unsurprising then that many parents described the joy that they and their children felt when playgrounds opened up as the restrictions began to ease here in Australia. One um, father said, my daughter's been so happy. The first time I took her back to her favourite playground, she had a huge grin on her face and she ran around playing on all of the equipment. For some of our participants, the loss of the everyday had a detrimental effect on their mental health. They reported that their own or their children's anxiety or depression escalated during lockdown to the point that they restarted antidepressants and or re-engage with their psychologist or psychiatrist. Some had found it, found it very hard to access you know, anonymous helplines. Um, here they're called Beyond Blue or Lifeline. Um, one autistic woman said, I'd have to call a couple of times. You just end up on hold forever. So I would just give up. Even more disturbingly, some were experiencing panic attacks, were self-harming and or talking about suicide. In a minority of cases, children or their, sorry, participants or their family members, including young people, were admitted to the hospital for acute psychiatric care for attempted suicide or, me or severe mental health distress. And this um, quote here that you can see comes from um, a parent um, who said, child has fared the worst due to COVID changes. They need to be able to get out of the house at least once a day. They find the home environment stressful, noisy, not often tidy, other anxious people. School helps them to stay on track. When we moved toward lockdown, they were starting to struggle to get schoolwork complete and attend school. They were also talking about suicide. This worsened as they withdrew to their room and they, we could no longer convince them to go out. Child continued to spiral, not leaving their bed for weeks and culminating in an attempted overdose. And this leads on to the third of the challenges. On the 29th of March of last year, the Australian government announced a $1.1 billion coronavirus program to enable people to see or speak to their GP, mental health and other providers for diagnosis or treatment via com computer or smartphone um, devices without having to leave their homes, so telehealth. Some of our participants were positive about telehealth services. They felt that it was quite an easy transition to telehealth and that it had actually been better. For those that felt either that telehealth was fantastic or was just about the same as face-to-face -face sessions, this meant that they had continuity of care, that, that they could continue their therapeutic sessions, including psychology, psychiatry, counselling, occupational therapy, speech therapy, behavioural therapy, during the initial um, COVID-19 lockdown period. But praise for telehealth was far from universal. So many participants, autistic adults, autistic parents, autistic children and young people also reported negative experiences with regard to telehealth. And this finding is quite striking because it goes against kind of common perceptions about autistic people, that they prefer online interactions because they can often reduce the emotional, social and time pressures um, experienced in face-to-face -face interactions. So I think it would have been reasonable to expect autistic people to have embraced telehealth but this is not what we found. So young people consistently reported negative experiences with telehealth. One young man said, just the idea of talking over Zoom and stuff is not the same as a real person. The parents of young children who had switched to telehealth to continue therapy sessions during lockdown, they too reported negative experiences. Their children struggled to engage, would engage with the first part of it, and then he'd just be over it and wander off, would get himself so upset, or it would send him into overload. One parent of a non-speaking autistic child told us, telehealth is something that you wouldn't consider at all from my perspective. It wouldn't work for our kids. For some young children, familiarity and well-established prior relationship was key. So one parent said, 
he'd been doing speech therapy in preschool all last year. So I think he had a good relationship and he understands what the session involves. But even established relationships with therapists didn't ensure engagement. So one parent said, you know, the speech therapist came into kindergarten and he knows that that's a time where you just sit down and you work with that therapist one-on-one, -on -one, but it just didn't translate to the computer screen. Parents of teenagers also reported that they simply, their children simply refused to do any therapies online um, during the lockdown period because it makes him feel uncomfortable, because they had an aversion to Zoom, or that she just kept walking away. It was pointless. The apparent unease in these online interactions sometimes had dire consequences with regard to their access to services during the, that initial lockdown period. So autistic adults, parents of autistic children, and especially young, young people themselves, simply decided either not to access telehealth services or to access them, to try them out, and then to stop them altogether because they felt that therapeutic sessions have to be face-to-face. -face. I need that personal interaction. Ultimately, this meant that many of our participants stopped receiving therapeutic services during the initial lockdown period. And one young person who was eventually admitted to a hospital during lockdown for severe um, mental health issues also describes how they had stopped all my psychologist appointments, which was a bad call, because if it's an online version of a medical appointment of any sort, I just dread it. And the dread is often worse than not doing the appointment. The fourth of the challenges is related to the third. So having to stay at home during the COVID-19 pandemic has obviously been difficult for everyone. But there were some reports in the news and on social media claiming that staying at home and self-isolating was ideal um, for autistic people. After all, as one autistic adult had said to me, we self-isolate, we do that all our lives. Autistic people are ready. So some of our participants and their children did indeed love self-isolation, particularly during that very early phase. <clears throat> they felt more relaxed, in part because there's been no social pressures, the demands and expectations of everyday social interactions were taken away. Far from welcoming the isolation that came from lockdown, our autistic participants deeply missed social contact. And in direct contrast to the orthodox view of autistic people as not caring about friendships as much as others, our young participants talked about how they continue to keep in touch with their friends during lockdown through texting, Instagram, video chat, online games. But they were resoundingly clear about the extent to which they missed the face-to-face -face embodied physical interactions with their friends. So one young man said to me, my friends, I really want to see them. I want to see my friends in person. People found staying at home challenging because all of, all of the social aspects of my life have been cut out. Some autistic adults were visibly distressed by this aspect of lockdown. Just not being able to see anyone has been really hard. I can't deal with being isolated like this. I just want to hug someone. This was even the case for autistic adults who very clearly stated, I don't need a lot of human contact but I've been really needing a lot more contact from my friends than I perhaps usually would. And one young person spoke about missing her best friend in more depth. She said, I prefer hanging out with him in person as opposed to just over text. So I haven't been talking to him as much as I do, but still somewhat, I've really missed that. It's rare that I find someone that I can actually talk to. And in the first five minutes, I'm like, oh yes, I know everything about you because you're me with different interests. When I do, you got to treasure that. Parents also described how much their children craved their friends, mentioning his friends a lot more or were always asking when she could play with her friends. And our participants' desire for social contact went further than their established social circles and quality friendships. So not having much, or in some cases, any social contact during the initial um, lockdown period made them long for it. So one adult said, 
you know, I didn't realize how important that incidental human contact was to me. It was so incidental that it never really registered on my radar until it was gone. She went on to give an example. The paying for the petrol at the service station, as much as it shits me, because I work with an assistance dog, right? So wherever I go, I've got this giant, white, majestic beast next to me. So the soundtrack of my life is, oh my God, it's a dog. It's a beautiful dog. What kind is he? How old is he? What does he do? And like, that drives me bananas most of the time. And I've actually found myself even missing that. Another young person said, I think there are some students who at school are just always messing about and do get on my nerves. But now that I think about it, I'm almost longing to just see them running down with a load of lolly packets, wanting them, wanting to sell them to each other. I've realized how much I would actually miss them. Mind you, it isn't a lot, but I wasn't expecting to miss them at all. So to conclude, on the positive side, many participants reported being glad that the relentless pressures of ordinary life had been lifted during the early months of COVID-19. In particular, people described how the lockdown period freed them from the often overwhelming demands and expectations of living in a neurotypical world, a world that isn't typically set up for them. On the negative side, many reported a decline in their and or their children's overall sense of well-being or mental health. But perhaps what was most striking was that participants most missed those aspects of social life that the pandemic lockdown measures took away. And this for our team was the most striking set of findings because it flies in the face of many common stereotypes about autism, that autistic people don't want friends, prefer a life of self-isolation. Our study shows how clearly that is not the case. Our participants mentioned again and again just how much they were missing their friends during lockdown. And then they were also missing their neighbours, their sh local shopkeepers and the general community. They also described missing the human contact that typically comes with from much service provision and felt that technological innovations like telehealth, at least it, as it was being delivered, were, were an inadequate substitute for face-to-face -face therapy and support. These findings have significant implications for theory and practice with autistic people. In our view, these initial findings led to you know, four um, important recommendations for policymakers here in Australia, obviously, um, but also elsewhere um, to consider as the COVID-19 crisis continues. Um, the first of these was that you know, preparation is vital that all levels of government need to invest in their emergency planning and have a, dis a distinct strategy for supporting potentially vulnerable people, um, including autistic people. And such a strategy would be considerably stronger if it involved autistic people themselves in its design. The second was that flexibility, time and reflective space matter. For our participants, the best of the COVID-19 experience has been the opportunity to spend more time at home, often with family. And this released autistic people from the pressures of everyday timetabling and expectations and was warmly received by many. There is, I think there is more that could be done to enable autistic people to enjoy these opportunities during more normal times. The third um, is that technology, technology is not a standalone healthcare solution. Existing face-to-face -face support structures are critical for the well-being of autistic people and mustn't be closed down again, if at all possible, without adequate alternatives being put in place. Continuity of care is vitally important to autistic people and their families, as are the social contacts and relationships that often come with service delivery and must be built into emerging alternatives, such as guaranteed, regular scheduled and individualised catch-ups with key workers someone essentially just to check up on them. The, and the fourth is that friendship and sociability need conscious support. So very little formal government effort was made during the first few months of COVID-19 to support autistic people in maintaining friendships and social connections in Australia or anywhere else in the world. And this was a serious mistake. 
we know that the, that the, the huge cost of loneliness and isolation on mental health, and it's the same for autistic people. We need a, a, a plan to help autistic people and others to maintain and even deepen their, their social relationships during these moments of crisis. The time to develop such a strategy is now, or before now, um, together with autistic people and their families. And the consequences of not doing so are obviously too, too serious to ignore. Thank you. Thank you especially to my wonderful um, autistic and non-autistic collaborators and to all the amazing autistic young people, adults and families who so generously took part in our research during what was a very unsettling time for many of them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, that was an absolutely fascinating and uh, such an important talk and also such a clear and engaging presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it. I'm sure everyone else has too. I am totally in awe of the scale of your study. Uh, mm -hmm. I just can't imagine doing that many interviews and analysing that many um, transcripts. Absolutely amazing. Um, We've had some lovely questions, really interesting questions um, through via Slido and on the chat. So I'm going to ask uh, as many as I can with the last few minutes. Um, the first one is, says, thank you for the brilliant talk. Do you have any recommendations um, for how we can support autistic individuals as the pandemic ends um, and we return to an in inverted commas normal? I wonder if that was sent a little bit before your last recommendations. Um, but do you want to add anything else to that? Yeah, I think actually that's a really good point in terms of <laughs> when when it ends, or whenever it's going to end. But um, I think here, um, definitely when lockdown eased uh, or like the restrictions eased um, in Australia, um, and that you know schools start started to go back, and um, essentially no one, you know, as in as in schools or or, um, or you know health officials really thought about preparing autistic children, young people, and even adults who are going back to work um, for the, the transition again um, back into the community. And I think that um, lots of people, we spoke to, they went that, we spoke to people largely um, who were, you know, during the lockdown period, but there were a few people who had um, in different states, because all of our states in Australia did different things. Um, so there were some states that um, eased restrictions earlier than others. And for those um, families, I remember speaking to um, parents who said that, you know, sometimes they, they, they were they were actually more worried about their children going back to school because there was just there was no preparation about, you know, there was no there was no thought by schools about how to prepare the, their children. So I definitely think that 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 needs to be um, planned for. And related to that, actually, uh, a question about the fact that, you know, for you guys, things are opening up a lot more, definitely a lot more than for us yet. Um, and you mentioned in the positives that keeping some of that flexibility and and those um, adaptations would be really welcome. Is there any indication as to whether some of those are being kept in place now that things start to open up? Um, no. I don't think so. Apart from the, um, you know, obviously the other on the, on this Zoom, <laughs> Zoom is everywhere. This is ongoing. <laughs> and there's lots of, um, I mean, the, in terms of work, I mean, there are some, um, offices that are not back to work here. Um, so they're still remote working. Um, my university has been back since August last year. So we're very encouraged to go into work. Um, but there's lots of flexibility in terms of everything is kind of a hybrid model of either face to face or kind of web conferencing. Um, but I mean, even, um, even people in, in, um, we also did a, so we did this study and then, um, um, in, I think it was July, August last year, Melbourne, Victoria, the state of Victoria or Melbourne had a second, um, outbreak, um, and went into lockdown, more severe lockdown than the first, um, um, with more severe restrictions than the first lockdown. And so people in Melbourne, we're essentially in an extended lockdown, as you've been, um, for, you know, six months. And so we spoke to 40, um, I think 40, 40 of our participants were from um, Victoria. And so we ended up doing kind of a longitudinal um, um, study where we spoke to 31 of the same participants. Um, and um, uh, for them, it was um, some of them, you know, basically hadn't seen much changes to what had, yeah, there was continuity, obviously, but, um, um, yeah, they, 
they ha they hadn't seen it and we've seen and we've spoken to them again and they haven't seen those kind of the changes that we might have expected there to to, be, to continue they haven't seen continue I'm, I'm racking my brain for an example but I can't think of one right now so it will come back to me that one <laughs> feel free to add it if it comes back yeah. <laughs> sorry Another question was uh, from someone asking whether you think that more exemptions should have been made for autistic people, I presume meaning uh, with respect to the restrictions. Um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think I think that um, I think the disability community more broadly should have been consulted. Um, in, in terms of the um, restrictions. Um, I know that um, many of the, I mean, as I'm sure it's with you as well, but um, many of the rules were very, were not clear at all. Um, and people, um, the, there was lots of ambiguity and um, people had a lot of, you know, difficulty working out whether they could go to a park or not go to a park. And, um, you know, obviously a lot, there was a lot of discussion about parks in our, in our study and about not being able to go to the park. Um, although you could go to the park if you didn't go on the play equipment, but, but some kids really needed to go on the play equipment. So, um, I think I worry, I worry that making exemptions might've just made things more, um, you know, more, rules for different sections of the um, um, community might have made things more difficult um, for some people trying to manage those rules um, and getting stressed about those rules um, but obviously people you know some people really needed those exemptions so I think I think that you know those kinds of um, policies should have been made in in collaboration with um, with um, the disability community and obviously the autistic community yeah um, a question here about um, the teletherapy. Uh, this one says, thanks for the eye-opening research result. Do you have an, do you also have non-verbal autistic participants who access teletherapy services for them? So we didn't speak to any, that we know, we, not that we know of, speak to any um, non-speaking autistic people. We had, I can't remember now, but I think there were about 12 people who did um, email interviews. So we don't know if they were non-speaking or not. Um, and a couple of people who did live um, web-based chat. The, um, I, I don't remember any of them, um, if whether they had access to or felt positive about the teletherapy. I mean, I remember the parents talking about their children basically saying that it just was not, it was just not possible at all. Um, but often, often they were quite young children um, who would just kind of just run away <laughs> from the computer or would kind of get confused when it was on an iPad that they were, you know, that they were using for as a reward. So to do fun things on and suddenly there was a person speaking at them. Um, so actually, I don't know about that question, actually. Sorry. All right. Um, question here asking, does your study suggest which group or characteristics of autistic people were more vulnerable to mental health problems during the lockdown? Um, in short, no, because it's a qualitative study. So we didn't really measure um, you know, people's characteristics and we weren't, that wasn't an aim of our study. Um, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, I think, um, I, th I think pre-existing anxiety and or mental health, you know, and depression, essentially, you know, mental health issues um, made a big difference to whether that, you know, um, they continued to, although those were exacerbated during the lockdown period. Um, I think not being able to, I think it was all a combination of those things. I think the, I think there were people, so one might expect that those who are less socially motivated, for example, um, might be okay with, you know, the lockdown because um, they, even if they have pre-existing mental health issues, because, you know, they don't necessarily feel that they might need um, social contact. But even those people, you know, we had people, lots of people within interviews would like describe how, you know, they, they would have this insight themselves. Like, I, I know that I'm not usually like this. I don't really like going out or going out to see people, um, but it's, I'm really, really struggling with this. Um, so I think 
the that, if you were looking at correlation, I don't think that would even hold up because I think even those who who would you know say that they weren't particularly um, socially motivated, um, that you know they really really struggled um, during um, the lockdown period. So um, I, I, I don't and I'm, and given it's a qualitative study, I definitely don't want to pin down any other factors like that. Good question though. Yeah, very interesting. Um, someone also wanted to know a little bit more about um, the concerns that you mentioned that people had around racism um, and asked, are these concerns from the ethnic minority groups? Yeah, these were particularly Chinese families. Um, so we had a few, we didn't have many, unfortunately, um, but we definitely had a few Chinese families who, um, um, who the ones I spoke to anyway, all of whom said that they had you know, were worried, essentially worried about, I don't think they had experienced anything um, as such, but they were really worried about kind of re-entering um, the community following lockdown. Um, so that was, a, yeah, definitely a real concern for them. And I think this is probably beyond the scope of the findings as well. Um, but some, someone was asking whether um, you think this would be worse or better in other countries Um whether you think the experience is, I presume, different for sure, but do you have any feelings about whether things are worse or better elsewhere? Yeah, so that's a good, good question. So what we um, what we have done as well is we did, um, my colleague collaborators in Sweden at the Karolinska, Karolinska Institute, um, they um, took our interview schedule and um, interviewed um, some autistic um, adults, parents and young people about their experiences as well. So they have about 35 interviews um, and I mean they've found very similar results kind of I guess unsurprisingly in some ways um, but what has been really interesting about the um, about the comparison is that um, our um, our participants seem to report much I mean, sorry the Swedish participants seem to report kind of mental health you know um, um, yeah, mental health issues during during lockdown. Um, they're definitely um, you know more worried, um, more flat, those kind of things. Our participants in Australia, their um, mental health concerns were much more severe. So they were there's much more profound essentially. And our thinking on this is that I mean Sweden um, took a very different approach, at least initially um, to the um, uh, to COVID-19 so they had fewer you know rules and restrictions um, because they expected people just to be able to you know to follow the rules of themselves you know follow the implicit rules themselves um, and here we had we had quite severe restrictions but we also know that Australians were very compliant um, very compliant in fact um, there's data showing that there's 95 percent compliance um, and so autistic people and autistic people might well have been more compliant um, perhaps than the non-autistic people, and so we wonder whether that that is causing some of the um, um, the, the kind of differences in the um, I guess the mental health um, uh, disparity. I think so. We we show you know with 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 more greater restrictions, particularly on social contact um, and um, greater compliance, we seem to find you know more mental health problems than in in Sweden, where there was. Um, um, fewer restrictions basically yeah so so to answer the question um yes potentially there are there are there are differences i mean the, i don't think qualitatively the differences so you know people still talked about you know missing social contact missing friends and um and other family they talked about you know they also talked a lot about the positives you know sometimes the online stuff schooling those kind of things but there was definitely um the mental health thing has really struck out we were still analyzing the comparative component of that study but that's what seems to be really striking and i'm putting it down to the policy context so that's the yeah very interesting um we have a question here uh saying thank you for this presentation a really great study um did you collect information around the impact the pandemic had on autistic children and young people with high sensory difficulties um we will have done <laughs> but we didn't measure that so, um, I mean, as, because it was a qualitative study, we measured very, um, um, we didn't use any kind of standardised measures at all. Um, we asked people about their background, their ethnicity, 
um, racial background and um, there's the kind of diagnostic history, their schooling. I mean, essentially a five to 10 minute questionnaire on their background. And then we let them tell their story in their own way. So we don't have really any information on, you know, specific attributes about their, the autistic kids or young people or adults. Um, but sensory stuff did come up a lot. Um, and in particular, the sensory stuff came up in terms of um, in how normal life, so pre-COVID, um, they're particularly in school and at work, um, you know, the sensory environment is really overwhelming. Um, and so often people talked about um, during the lockdown period, things were much quieter. Um, and, um, you know, that essentially those, the, that sensory overwhelm had often been taken away. Not always, because lots of our families had multiple autistic children or, just, or other children and siblings in the, in, the, in the house. So sometimes it was um, not necessarily a, um, a quiet environment. Um, but for lots of people, that, de that definitely came out as a, as a sub theme. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so apologies in advance for anyone whose questions I didn't get to ask, but here's the final one. Um, uh, someone asking, how might parents better support their autistic children during this um, challenging pandemic? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer, but um, what is um, really interesting, um, we're just writing up the, um, so we've kind of split the, um, obviously there's a lot of data here, so we've kind of split the, um, the writing of the manuscripts at least. So we've got a mental health manuscript and we're just finishing off the, um, the manuscript that's focused on education, remote learning. Um, and one of the things that is really um struck us is that so you might remember that they're in our 83 four families parents I can't remember how many you've got um lots of parents um we have 35 autistic parents and so 47 eight um non-autistic parents um which is interesting because there's very very little research on, on autistic parents to begin with but what is it's kind of come up in the um in the data is that non-autistic parents were, I mean, everyone was really stressed about remote learning. That, there's no doubt about that. Everybody generally is really stressed, but everyone now some is also, was also very stressed about um, remote learning. Um, um, even if their kids enjoyed it, very, it was just stressful. But um, non-autistic parents seem to be really stressed about um, getting stuff done or not getting stuff done. So, you know, trying to work out what the expectations are were from the teachers and the school and, and essentially like, oh my God, the, you know, my child has only completed one task out of the 10 that they have to complete for today. And like, so they were really stressed about, essentially about the academics. Um, and what was really interesting, um, and I think a real positive, was that the autistic parents were, and I think because many of, you, of our autistic parents had um, co-occurring mental health issues themselves. Um, so they were well aware of the need for self-care. Um, and so with their children, they had basically decided that they would concentrate on their well-being. They weren't worried about academics. I mean, on, on some level, they, of course they were, but like um, some of them were like, no, we're not going to do that at all. We're going to have our own timetable. He's going to do this much. Um, and we're, you know, we're going to get our mental health in check because that's way more important um, than trying to, you know, <laughs> do academic stuff at the moment. Um, and so I think, uh, I mean, I, I think that was, I think that's a really, really encouraging <laughs> and positive thing to take away. Um, that uh, obviously this has been a really hard time for so many people um, and, um and it's been a long time for so many people, um, but you know the men mental health effects are will and will be, um, you know, really severe um, in the long term. And I think that kind of protection of those 
um, of, of, of mental health. So, you know, doing, I mean, some of our participants talked about kind of doing, even doing mindfulness stuff like, um, and yoga and getting their kids to go for, I mean, the kids themselves would take themselves, the young people also talked about taking themselves out to, you know, for a walk or whatever to de-stress. There's loads of um, um, individual initiatives, which was, is, yeah, really fantastic. So I think that would be my number one suggestion is to take the stress out of it, if that's at all possible, um, and to kind of focus on well-being.